David, and you're listening to the Tobey's Classical Guitar Podcast. A couple schedule changes I wanted to note. I'll be swapping the order for Jorge Caballero and Richard Savino, and Mark Teichelt's episode um, will be released now in early 2019. We'll be featuring Elliot Fisk on December 23rd. So for today, we've got Javier Hara on the show. The concept I kind of had for these past two episodes was to have a teacher-student pair. Javier studied with Judical Perrault in France before winning the 2017 GFA competition. And after completing that tour, he moved to San Francisco to work on his master's degree under the tutelage once again with Perrault. So we had talked about Judical's influence on him as a musician along with his experience winning the GFA competition and collaborating with Norbert Kraft to record his Noxos album. A little surprise for today's episode, we'll be offering a free month of Tonebase Premium once again if you haven't used the code yet. So head over to Tonebase.co, sign up, and when prompted, type in the coupon Tonebase-podcast, all uppercase and all one word. Let's go ahead and take a listen to a recording of Javier's. This is from his Noxos record. This is Dushan Bogdanovich's Mysterious Habitats. <laughs> bit about this cd you recorded this uh if i'm correct uh as part of your gfa prize yeah that's right it was um sort of part of the gfa prize and uh recorded that uh, last year 
Um, the CD is kind of unique because I feel like when you're sort of given a CD contract just like that without sort of any strings attached, that instead of doing something that is um, that would play to more of a mainstream audience that would actually be bought by a record company, I tried to do something that wouldn't be. So something a bit more, um, um, something that I want to do but that maybe wouldn't be successful normally otherwise. So you pretty much had full say for repertoire. You, yeah, you just did what you wanted. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Good for <laughs> you. It, you know, it, not as much with classical, but you see it with classical, the way record companies are working. You can definitely tell that a lot of these artists are kind of constricted by what the producers are telling because at the end of the day they want to make money you know which is true people yeah. have got to make money but it, sometimes it kind of halts some creativity so it's great that yeah, that wasn't the case for this kind of halts some of the process i guess it was julian bream i think that he had a contract where he was um the record company was just telling him exactly what to play and then i think he recorded the 20th century guitar album and that was like a huge success and then after that, they let him do anything he wanted. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you should for Julian Bream, especially. Yeah. Um, and, and this was recorded with Norbert Kraft, right? That's right. Yeah. That's, that's got to be uh, it's got to be really unique recording with somebody who knows so much about the guitar to begin with. Yeah, he's uh, he's really does his job incredibly well. And I mean, you can depend on him for a lot of things. Uh, dep you can depend on him for the sound. Um, he's very precise. He'll, he's the kind of guy that will, you know, call you at your hotel room and say, I'll be there in three and a half minutes to pick you up. And then he walks through the door three and a half minutes and a half. later. Not 320. No, no. Not three, three and a half minutes three later. And a half. Yeah, wow. yeah. I think this has something to do with just, uh, you know, being in post edit for so long. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, and it, I've never recorded a professional CD, but I just have a feeling, you know, if I had a recording engineer who just doesn't know classical guitar that well it might be a bit unnerving you know because it, it's definitely it's a different sound and everyone kind of has their own perception of how something should sound after being recorded but i mean norbert in case of any of our listeners don't know i mean he was like the hottest canadian player yeah. uh on the guitar scene for on the years. cover of all the classical guitar magazines yeah yep and uh Especially at CD, uh, the Via Lobus works. I mean, That's that, right, that yeah. one's just huge inspiration to me. Um, he doesn't really play anymore, though, does he? Or no, he's he's focusing on he's uh, focused recording. More, yeah, now. Yeah. But um, he, I think he he told me he does something like two CDs a week. Wow, which is a lot. I mean, it's a lot recording of recording or post. Or? Uh, both. Wow. Yeah. So usually he has two recording sessions a week, and then uh, so him, he's him, doing but more. But him and his wife are Bonnie Silver. They're both. Uh, they have the same job essentially, so they. You know, give they each collaborate. other work. Yeah, so they he's doing more than just guitar records, or is yeah, it, oh, much yeah. more than just guitar uh, records. I have he no does, idea. I mean, you can consider that if an Axel CD is coming out of Toronto, then he's done it, and actually, yeah. most of them do come out of Toronto. And so. the sound he gets is just amazing. Yeah, and as we're talking about earlier, it's just a super simple setup, right? He's using just two mics and an amazing yeah, yeah, acoustically. It, it is, it is, church. Yes, exactly. It, and it is, uh, it is kind of simple, but it's also, it's also not simple. The church isn't simple. So there's no sort of reverb added besides, you know, the natural sound of the, of the church, but the church is so old that the, the heating is, uh, uh, makes noise. Ooh, so okay. they have to, you know, I recorded in January in Toronto, which is quite cold. Yeah. And so it was, it was, uh, the, the heating would, make noise if after like 20 minutes after you turned it off with these bangs and clanks and so you can't record for like 20 minutes until the heating's you know after the heating's turned off so and it's a so bit finicky it's, yeah it's a bit finicky and you know i was doing things like i had a hot water bottle to warm my hands up and stuff that, that, oh, man. that norbert would come in and give me every like <laughs> every 20 minutes and uh oh i had no idea about that i mean yeah that, but that, that's actually an important and an interesting point because i think that all the guitar recordings that are recorded in that church are a bit slow to be honest and uh it has to do with the temperature and also the hall because and when you say slow you mean just in regards to the time it takes to record all the tracks uh no i mean in in the way that players actually perform their pieces if you oh, listen if you listen okay. to them play normally or the live the tempi the, yeah the tempi is is a lot uh, quicker and this has to do with just one the temperature if you have cold hands, you naturally play slower because if you play sort of the, your regular tempo, it's going to sound like you're playing too fast if you have cold hands. 
And the other thing is just that you can actually enjoy it in such in that nice church because you just sort of listen to the sound come back at you, and you can take a more gradual tempo. But that's one thing I've noticed about uh, all the CDs. I never thought of that. I'm I'm going to have to listen to it uh, again with that mindset. But uh, it's never to the point where it's like, oh, this is too slow. But oh, maybe no, it no. opens up the musicality a bit. Yeah, you know, if the person doesn't feel quite as rushed, and also they're, you know, I I think there's something with confidence even for the best players out there like you when it just sounds really great i think you probably feel better while you're playing it. and when you feel better it's going to be more of a passionate relaxed performance because those acoustics they sound amazing on the mics i'm sure they sound amazing in person mm-hmm. am i correct saying that uh, yeah yeah they do so <laughs> it, it probably just opens up things like you know because i i've played in concerts where i'm in a hall and it is dead like just the most dead hall and I'm playing and I'm just thinking in the back of my head, this is bad. I am sounding awful. My tone's off. The phrasing's off. And then I listened to a recording of it. And of course, yeah, I didn't have that nice reverb that Norbert has access to, but it it was fine. You know, and I think when you don't have a nice sounding room, it's very easy to be critical. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of, it's that thing of just, you have to adjust yourself to whatever sort of situation you're in. So the way you play in one room cannot be the same way you'd play yeah. in another room because it's not going to sound the same. And for my taste, I much prefer the approach Norbert goes in regards to recording, finding a great space acoustically as opposed to going into a studio with very dry acoustics on purpose, no sound reflections and all that jazz. So this is the audiophile side of me kind of coming out and then <laughs> adding uh, reverb plugins and posts. You know, I mean, that can be done very well right. as well. And honestly, it's easier because you don't have to deal with the sounds of the church and everything. But there is, it's kind of like digital versus analog. There is something beautiful right. about natural sounds. And he, and he does, you know, love that church. That's been yeah. his, his spot for, I don't know how long now. Do but... you know how he discovered it? Did he just go to a service there or something? And... Uh, well, it's, it's something, it's just a place he find. I don't know how he discovered it, but it's a place that he finds is particularly um, good for the guitar yeah. because of the mixture of brick and wood yeah. in the church. And, I mean, it, it sounds amazing. And it's uh, an it interesting, really uh, from photos I've seen, it's an interesting space architecturally. It's not very traditional looking. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not it's a not square. Your, <laughs> it's not your kind of traditional pyramidal kind of right. chapel you see most of the time. But it works great. Anyway, I, I'd love to hear you talk. Uh, is there a story behind this beautiful piece of Bogdanovich uh, that we just listened to? Yeah, there is a bit of a story. So, um, well... Okay, so strangely enough, I'm, well, I'm in San Francisco now, this is where we are, mm-hmm. and a few of the composers featured on the, C- on the CD um, have lived in San Francisco and have taught here, um, including Dusan Bogdanovich. Uh, Dusan Bogdanovich wrote that piece, Mysterious Habitats, uh, based on Mysterious Barricades, or Les Barricades Mysterieux by François Coupon, oh, okay. which is a harpsichord piece. And uh, so this is a you know a famous piece, and and so this is Dusan Bogdanovich kind of homage to it, but he takes a different take in that he uses sort of some polyrhythmic themes, and uh, he also what I feel is kind of an homage to uh, American minimalism. Hmm. So essentially, I decided to take a a different stance as far as recording that piece because it has been done before by you know other American guitarists, but I wanted to take the the position of playing it a little bit more like Steve Reich. Okay. where it would be sort of more like percussion music and very direct sounding. So instead of, um, and I play it a little bit faster than written, so instead of, you know, flow and freeing, I play it a little bit more um, direct. and Yeah, and, yeah. kind of in your face. Yes, exactly. Phasing? No, maybe not, maybe not that <laughs> oh, I crazy. wish, but... <laughs> yeah, you, you, we, we should have a guitar, or I'm sure somebody has played that arrange, quote-unquote, arrange for guitar. I, I mean, it sounds stupid. Which one, like violin phase or, or piano or, phase? Or piano phase, something like that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah they have. <laughs> I, I feel silly saying, like, in a, a transcription for that. It's like having a transcription for that John Cage Or not, or no, How many notes is that? Like seven or something? Yeah, yeah. And I see on your CV you've got... Uh, mysterious barricades the Cooper on. Yeah. So was that kind of the idea? You know, you introduce that yes, classic absolutely. Baroque piece first, and well, yeah, it's... I, well, actually, the CD has a sort of a hidden um, kind of form to it. So um, the centerpiece of the CD is in the middle, and that's uh, Dreams by Sergio Assad, which um, is really I, I love to play this piece. It's very interesting. Um, but then after that, I take it as sort of a symmetrical um, 
image. So after dreams in front of it and after it are um, two elegies, one by the British composer Alan Rochthorne and one by the American composer Jeremy Collins. And the one that was written by Alan Rochthorne, um, Alan Rochthorne actually wrote this elegy and, well, he didn't finish it. And he died, I think, in a car accident before he finished wow. it. And Julian Bream uh, was the one who commissioned it and he wrote sort of the last part of it. And so anyways, wow. um, these two elegies are side by, you know, they're, they're after the dreams. And then on the sides of the elegies, there are two variations by Tedesco. One is the variations through the century. And the other one is uh, one of the Capriccio variations, number 18. Um, after that, I, I place both the Mysterious Rondos, which is Les Barricades Mysterious and Mysterious Habitats by Bogdanovich. And then I have uh, just... Uh, you know, and as the first three pieces on the CD, um, Three Fantasies by Dowland, and as the last piece on the CD, Bogdanovich's Sonata 3, um, which, strangely enough, have something to do with each other in the weird way that Bogdanovich is capable of writing music. Um, Sonata 3 is, is not going to be for everybody. I'm not going to lie here. It's, you know, it's a very intellectual piece. It's very um, based on 20th century European composers such as Berg, Stravinsky. Okay. It uses quite a few um, quotations like from the Rite of Spring, from the Berg song cycles. It uses uh, quite a few Messiaen modes. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of, you know, intellectual piece, but at the same time, it has this kind of use of counterpoint, which is very Renaissance and, and Dowland-esque in, in some ways. So so the, the whole CD has this kind of symmetrical uh, It's got a face. very nice arc to it. I've got to ask, uh, with the Stravinsky quote, does yeah. he quote that amazing chord uh, yeah. the rhythmic you know pers- the rhythmic uh yeah the 52 that, that, 52 that, that, chords that, that, so yeah that, 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 does he quote that chord or no <laughs> no it's oh, not that bummer. one it's, it's the theme in well, the beginning we, we don't have enough strings to pull that off yeah there's this amazing video on youtube if you just like stravinsky talks about right at spring he you know he's just he was a weird looking I, dude i've seen that you seen it? Yeah, and he, he, it 52 right. times the same chord <laughs> <laughs> like, I, and he, my favorite part is that the piano he's like i i like this chord very much and then he just starts playing it on the piano and he's looking at the camera just gr- smiling from ear to ear, like the most yeah. creepy <laughs> grin i've ever seen it literally looked like a horror movie it cracked me up so much but um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing piece, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for a split second in the back of my head, I thought, maybe that would be cool as guitar quartet. And I'm sure someone's done it. But then when I think about it, I don't think it would have the... Yeah, it's, the, it's, it's a little bit... It, it wouldn't have, have the, the power. The, there is a version, I think, that's for two pianos. And I've heard it a few times, and it's it just doesn't have that, that the, power. If yeah. two pianos doesn't have the power, four guitars, or... Yeah. yeah. Well, well, there's the sort of color option that's that's kind of nice. Is yeah, it, yeah. It becomes a bit more symphonic than with two pianos. Yeah. yeah. No, it's um, it, it's one of the most moving works I've ever heard live. I saw Dudamel. Uh, I mentioned this last episode. I saw Dudamel perform it uh, or conduct it with uh, L.A. Phil at Disney Hall, and it's still to this day, I mean, I I remember just. After that last note, everyone was just screaming. I felt like I was at a rock concert or something. It's like, this, this is what music should always oh, be yeah, like. Man. People should be that passionate. You know, people were throwing beer cans on the... No, I wasn't that bad. But, um, <laughs> but it's crazy to think, you know, when that first premiered, people were throwing tomatoes and rioting and like fist fights breaking yeah. out arrests and everything. Yeah. And then now it's kind of considered one of the greatest gems. Oh, even, music. even in its first premiere, I guess it had like a weekend where it was being premiered and the, you know, it had three showings day after day. Yeah. And the first one was the famous kind of riot scene. Yeah. But apparently by the third day, it was like they, they were, you know, he was, cra- he was crowd surfing on people wow. outside the hall. <laughs> like it was such a success by then. That's you know? amazing. No, it's, um, it's definitely, um, a piece that's, uh, going to stay in the music world forever. Um, so you recorded this Noxus album for GFA. How was your experience all together with the tour and everything? Did you find it kind of really helped launch your career in ways? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, yeah, this is definitely something that we have to kind of get into a little bit because uh, it's for such a huge experience. I mean, I, I did 60 concerts this last year. And that's kind of, uh, it's, it's difficult to sum that up in some ways. Yeah. But my experience with GFA, I mean, I, I, I seriously adore the GFA. And I have for a long time because I remember it was like my first GFA I went to when I was 15. I'd been playing guitar for a few years. And, uh, 
And that just blew my mind. I mean, that really kind of stuck it to me. Like, okay, here are concerts. This is how it's done. You know, you can see all these things. And and um, and that really left an impression. So I think I, I've, you know, since then, I've, I've sort of been a little bit a part of the family. But, uh, of course, I was in, in France for a while, so I didn't go to GFA for like five or six years and then until the one in Denver. Um, but as an institution, I think it's, I think it's phenomenal because... Um, you know, the United States, it's, it's a very special thing that people come together despite having the finances for it and the funding for, for keeping classical guitar alive sometimes. Yeah. But coming together through just the love of it in different parts of the United States and, and really making it happen. And that's kind of incredible. And then, you know, I, I can do this GFA tour and I meet literally everybody. And it's and that's also really special because, like, you, you meet the whole family and there's... Uh, you meet all the the enthusiasts from every corner, and uh, and that's really special. And I think it's, it's a more so than launching a career, because that I, you know la- launching a career sometimes that's difficult. That that almost sort of suggests that you have concerts backed up for years and years, you know, however long you want. Yeah. But uh, as far as launching a career goes, I you know I I saw it more as an education for how kind of things can be done in the United States and how things are working here right now at this very moment. So it was uh, 60 concerts yeah. all together? Yeah. That's a lot. That's awesome. And how, how long of a time period? Over a year? Or? I was from September until about May. Wow. And I had a break. I had a break in December. And there was, you know, master classes was it the throughout. same program you're performing or were you yeah, changing oh, it Yeah, gosh, up? no. Well, this, this is partly why I say it was more of an education. Um, I mean, this is an uh, interesting point, too, because, you know, I'm a, I was a student before, so I, I never really gotten the chance to play concerts and get that kind of experience. But I had some experience in competitions, and, and I could do that all right. But then, um, you know, I'm, I'm all too aware of how different it is um, competing versus performing. And, you know, the strategic elements that are involved in competing do, are non-existent when you're performing a concert. And this has been very liberating to me in some ways because it's been like, okay, so how do I want to present myself? What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? And how do I want to formulate these concerts? So when I started uh, the tour, I, my, well, first of all, my program was too long and I didn't realize it was too long. And, uh, and then also I took out a few pieces which I found weren't ne- always very acceptable to the audience. And I tried to structure it eventually in a more kind of hol- holistic form so that it made sense um, as, a, as just one concert. And I changed the program many, many times throughout the tour. And until eventually I would say about, you know, to the last third of the tour, I really had a program down that I was absolutely passionate about and thought yeah. was really good, yeah. Oh, the, well, that's great. You still felt passionate about the program at the end because I've definitely talked to some people. I think just the, uh, the the repertoire they chose, you know, maybe they didn't quite think it 100% through and they definitely kind of felt burnt out, but it doesn't sound like you felt burnt out by the music at the end of it. Well, that, I'm, I'm sure yeah. a bit. I'm <laughs> yeah. sure a bit. No, absolutely. absolutely. Well, that's the, that's the, you've, that's a good point because this is, um, I, I have, you know, I've talked to other GFA winners too, and I know how sort of hard that experience can be for some. Yeah. And, uh, and, but that's, that was the huge challenge to be honest, because it was something like one month in, I, I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? How am I going to actually give the emotional content that these concerts need every single time when you're being, you know, doing like two or three concerts a week and being told to just play? Yeah. So this is, uh, and this, this forces you essentially to think very fast about, about who you are, how you see music, how you see performing, and to find a way to be comfortable with yourself in it. And so this was, again, like this, this great kind of learning experience that I had to sort of deal with. But I'm, and I'm happy that by the end of it, I'm st- I was still kind of giving, trying to give every single concert 100%. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it makes me think about rock stars and famous rock bands, you know, because... They have to play those hits everyone wants to hear, or else people are going to be like, "What the?" That's f-? right, you yeah. know. And yeah, I, I just can't imagine, you know, if <laughs> I play. I mean, I'd love it. Don't get me wrong, but you know, if I happen to be in ACDC, like I, I would probably be so sick of Highway to Hell or something yeah. like that. You know, the That's only bad I can think of who have such a big following but just don't care 
about playing the hits and do what they want as Radiohead, but they're mm. very different in many other in many senses, other ways too. You know, yeah, that's right. Um, well, uh, and with guitar too, you get sort of the hits that you know. There are some people who just know you from one YouTube video or something. Like I want to hear that again. Yeah, and then, like for me, I I, I don't know. It's always about this one Scarlatti sonata I used to play, which I don't play anymore. And it was it was very much so just a competition piece for me. That's why I don't play anymore. And you're probably sick of people <laughs> yeah, saying, "Oh, I'm, can you play that Scarlatti sonata yeah, again?" Yeah, I'm sick of playing it. Yeah, is what's what's more. And then it was just like everybody's you know asking, "Oh, but why didn't you play the Scarlatti sonata?" Or, or it was the same thing with the Rodrigo Toccata. Why didn't you play the Rodrigo Toccata? And it's, ah, it's just you know it's not the time or I don't feel like it. So I have a little bit more liberty with that. I feel like yeah. I can just say, "Well, too bad." <laughs> yeah. Now now that you kind of have your name down in the books even more. No, I. There's definitely a couple pieces I've played that, you know, it's just like it worked well for competition, so I just kept playing it. And then I have friends like, oh, you should play that piece again. Why don't you play that anymore? It's just like it, it, this is probably to a much, much lower extent in all factors compared to you, but I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, it was Sasha Waltz for me. It's an amazing piece, but it, it drives me nuts now. Yeah, you know, I performed absolutely. it uh, too many times for myself, you know, and everyone mm -hmm. kept saying, oh, can you please play this on this show? And it's I'm yeah. not at the point where I'm able to say no, you know, because barely anyone knows my name, uh, except for me and my mom. But uh, no, and me. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm here. No, no, it's um, it's really interesting to kind of hear your take. It's very uh, on GFA. It's very kind of humble and refreshing to hear someone talk about it in that sense instead of just yeah i won it i did these concerts and that i'm done you know it's uh there's definitely a lot that goes into it you know in many aspects you know um mm. with the 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 foundation for gfa and everything they do amazing things it's probably one of the bigger resources for festivals and competitions out there in the u.s absolutely so you won gfa and Right after that, you enrolled back into school. You're a student again, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you're with Judy Kyle once again. And yep. um, how 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 is that? Okay, so um, you know I was in France for about five years and studied with him there. And uh, now this decision to kind of go back to school after doing the tour um, has to do with because I, I don't have my master's degree, and I would really like to have my master's degree. <laughs> yeah. And this was just because uh, I actually I didn't finish the master's degree at Paris Conservatory um, because of too many absences with concerts. Oh, okay. So you like were that. you were working on a master's, yeah, was, and then you won was, the competition. Yeah, gotcha. exactly. And um, it also has to do with the place a little bit because um, you know San Francisco is a hub for new music in the mm -hmm. United States, and is uh, also happens to be one of my favorite cities. And so then when I was in France, you know, Judica was kind of going back and forth whether he's going to come here and accept this job. And, and I, was kind of, I was kind of telling him that he should really do it. Cause <laughs> really you wanted to go to yeah, San Francisco. For some, reason, <laughs> for some reason, I wanted to see him here. You know, I thought that'd be great for American guitar as well. It's just like having somebody like that here who's, you know, kind of who does have such a high standard. Yeah. Um, for such his, a big proponent uh, to the classical guitar world. Yeah. All together. Yeah. And he's got a big studio. I mean, 16 players. Huh? And I, I'm assuming he's still touring a bit, you know, yeah, he's while still, he's teaching. Still performs. And he has 16 students. That's uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, what, what's the experience been like um, studying with him? You know, because we, we're, I mentioned it. We didn't go too in depth in the last episode that he's, I don't know if it's exactly true, but he's probably had the most GFA winners out of students, you know, and not that competitions or everything but it's a yeah. pretty good sign he knows what he's doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a it's a good kind of uh yeah it's a good sign it's true um the the thing the thing about that is is just kind of i know it might even frustrate him a little bit that uh because he does have so many students who ended up winning that competition that it ends up becoming a bit like he's this kind of competition guitarist yeah or competition teacher. But he's a very musically driven yeah. person altogether. Well, I, I would say that um, as far as a teacher, he does something very unique, which I haven't seen before, at least not in guitars, that he's just, um, you know, it's, it's very simplistic at times. It's, it's, it's basically just like a coach. He just gives you, for me, he just gives me his honest opinion. You know, no bull 
just uh, what he thinks and uh, maybe talks a little bit of his own experience. We can talk back and forth. Maybe one week it's not going so well. We can talk about why it wasn't going so well. So it's more like a really a personal coach. He's not going to give you everything, but he's going to give you something um, very special. And, uh, and I think that's, that's something I don't really want to lose in my life, despite the fact that um, I've, uh, you know, I'm retired from competitions now, at least after the GFA. Yeah. So, no, it's, um, you know, there's many different types of teachers. And you can definitely tell the students who do absolutely 100% everything their teacher tells them to do, and they tell them to phrase this and do this dynamic and do this fingering and everything. And yeah, you sometimes need a bit of that, you know, um, not, not directing that towards you, but some students need that. Um, but it's, um, I think a really good teacher knows how to be open about things, teach them in a way where they give them all these possibilities, but they have the trust in the student that they will make their own artistic decisions because there's still the student needs to have their own opinion or else it's just going to sound like a robot absolutely you know? that's a hard balance as a teacher you know because it's um it's really like and, I, and if i think of judicata that way it's you know something that he doesn't really give you the answer straight up you know but he'll he'll guide you to sort of find it yourself because if you if you just gave you the answer, you wouldn't know what to do with it. You really have to yeah. sort of go through the journey yourself to it's do like it. It's like taking notes in a class. You can just copy them down and sure you'll have the answers. But if you don't understand how you reach that solution, it's pointless. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Yeah. That's really refreshing to hear. And um, it's a pretty high level, I'm assuming, uh, at San Francisco. We've got you there now and Marco Topshi, um, who's a, another monster player. And... Um, it's quite a hub, and you guys got quite a nice guitar collection there as well. Yeah. Have you kind of uh, <laughs> played around with those different guitars? Uh, yeah, I have. I mean, I've you know I've been to David's office and I've David Tannenbaum's office and tried a few of the guitars in there. But then there's the Dean Harris guitar collection, which is really what I'm excited to see. And and I haven't been able to touch those yet, but I guess next month um, we're gonna get the chance. Oh, very cool. Yeah, they have you know Ramirez and. Uh, I don't know, Kono and Hauser and oh, wow. everything. So, yeah. Have you ever played a Hauser before? Oh uh, yeah, I've played a couple now. Yeah, they are actually well, they're my favorite guitars. And in fact, the couple of guitars that I've bought in the last couple of years have been, um, well, one's been a copy of a Hauser, and uh, just a replica, and one has been sort of an advancement, sort of more modern advancement on the same idea of sound design, um, which was done by Marshall Brunet, uh, Richard Brunet's son. But I'm, I'm passionate about these Hauser guitars because I just feel like uh, me as a player, I love to push in the right hand. And yeah. uh, these guitars have kind of an unlimited, sort of a limitless potential with the, ex the amount of expression that can be pulled out even within that kind of loud range. You can really dig in. That's them. right. Even when the sound kind of breaks, there's something appealing about it on yeah. those guitars. No, it's a, uh, what are you playing on? Are you playing on a traditional guitar for you? Yeah, well, right, right now it's kind of a traditional guitar. Um, well... I've, I'm kind of the idea also at, here at the conservatory is that I'm probably gonna you know have like ninety percent of my rep is gonna be Ponce, uh, Manuel Maria Ponce, and uh, that's also a decision because I want to work on that music with Judica because I think he has kind of a, a important um, way of playing that music that adds a. a a very sort of expressive side that hasn't really been seen before in playing Ponce. Yeah. Um, so actually Ponce on a Hauser, which are Segovia's guitars, you know, um, this is the, for me, the idea that Ponce had in his head when he was thinking of Segovia playing yeah, his music. Yeah. And it just fits so well on the instrument. And I find myself doing things that are more Segovia than Segovia, you know? It's like, okay, f instead of the first string, the second string, Segovia says, well, I'll play it on the third string. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of thing, you know, really milk milk it. And So you own a Hauser or are you planning no, it's, on it's, playing the Hauser? No, it's, I, I, own, I own a Hauser replica. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, so you're playing on, a Brunet, on the Brunet replica for the... Uh, yeah, I'm playing on a replica, which was done by Enrico Botelli, who's an Italian builder. Oh, okay. And, uh, but I'm also playing on uh, Marshall Brunet, which isn't a replica, but has kind of the same principles of design as Hauser does, but with a sort of modern advancement. And that's also great for Ponce, but I can put, play more modern stuff like Brower and Takamitsu yeah. on it, and it has the well, range. Well, it's very refreshing to see someone who's done so well in the competition circuit, you know, be so successful on a traditional guitar. And it really kind of shows, in my opinion, you know, 
how great of a system that style of making really is. You know, because everyone kind of, not everyone, sorry, but a lot of people kind of perceive double tops and lattice to be much larger than traditional. And I, I think it's baloney, honestly. I mean, they're a bit poppier and they're easier to get sound out of. But I think if you stand in the back of a hall, the sound of a traditional guitar is going to be much more clear, much more colorful. And your, think, your ears adjust no matter what, you know? Yeah. It's like if you're in the audience, even if it is a little bit quieter, you're, you kind of listen in a little bit more. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of the funny thing, like, uh, I, I notice that if I do have amplification in my concerts, the louder the amplification, the more people talk during the concerts. Yeah. And there's something about kind of special about the quiet sound of the guitar and this intimate solo instrument. Absolutely. That, uh, you know, draws people in and you just shut up and listen to the concert in, in total silence. You know, when it's, everyone are, is always like, oh, how's the projection on that guitar? I hate that actually, question because it's like, okay, here's the thing. Oh, yeah. Here's the thing. Even if it's a small man, which is, quote unquote, one of the loudest guitars out there, it's still quiet. You know, the guitar is always going to be a quiet instrument. So I just never get this. Uh, I mean, obviously, you do need a certain amount of projection, but I don't get this obsession of having the loudest guitar out there, especially at the sacrifice of yeah. tone. You know, so, and there's yeah, some. If I, if I was going to play a banjo, I would have played group bluegrass. Yeah, right. Sessions. Yeah, no, no, no. I totally agree with you. I totally agree. I mean, you know, I'm not going to give yeah. names. You know, I don't want to burn any bridges, but there's some guitarists, you know, I have huge respect for the musical and everything, but they're playing on. Um, a small man, and it, it, you know, there, the the one guy who whose tone doesn't really bother me, Tomas Velto. I think he actually has a beautiful tone, and I can't believe he gets that sound out of the small man. I I don't get it because it's beautiful sounding to me, but it's very much at the expense of tone. You know, building that very thin top lattice brace, and I have played very few lattice guitars that are actually actually quite smooth and sweet yeah and creamy with tone but it's usually not the case and you know for, for for me it's more it's like freedom of expression this is kind of the what i'm trying to look for because even if you get into that forte range it's how much expression can you get out of a forte can you make it sound more violent can you make that forte sound rounder and some guitars you don't really have the capability to control that especially double tops it's a very especially kind of... see the 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 thing with double tops and lattice is that you're oftentimes controlling your technique to the point of for me over controlling and this, this means that essentially you have to control the sound so much that you're using very precise small movements. And this, you know, this is the aesthetic of playing. This is fine. But for me, in my, when, I, when I think of technique on the guitar or any other instrument, essentially the ideal is to get a larger range of motion so that you have a larger range of expression. Yeah. And this has less to do with volume, whereas it's more of just uh, characters and, and what you can get out of it. And... Uh, and so I and I can't really do that with a lattice braced or double top guitar. But and I have to say that I did have a lattice braced guitar for, you know, like the GFA and all the competitions I did. And I only started playing the um, traditional guitars um, about halfway through the tour. Um, and probably really refreshing, very refreshing. And this this is part of the same thing, like of, of me allowing myself to do something that I know um, wouldn't necessarily be very favorable in a competition because when you're doing a competition and you know which I, I was doing these for a few years and pretty much just that um you really are looking for some sort of um strategic um yeah, you're looking for some sort of a strategic advancement with how, how you can play and uh and you're always looking at it in a comparative setting with your colleagues and this is a bit screwed up because it goes completely out of line with any sort of organic view of how music is. Yeah. Because the truth is, if you, especially if you're a solo instrumentalist, then there is no first or second place up there on stage with you, you know? There's, it's ridiculous to compare yourself to others in that way. And the problem that I would have with competitions then is that, of course, you're being a little bit forced to compare yourself to other people. If, you're, if you want a chance, you have to think strategically and, and It's things very like this. kind of synthetic sometimes and i you know when i was in high school and these were much smaller competitions compared to what you've done uh but i was definitely doing as many competitions as i could and i had a love-hate relationship you know because in ways it was kind of the first time i really started taking guitar really seriously so it was great in regards to having exactly uh, something to work towards but then on the other hand First of all, I played the same three damn pieces over and over again. That's why I hate, I, not hate it, but that's why I can't really play the Usher Waltz anymore. It's right. just, I overdid Overplayed, it. Overplayed, yeah. Um, and, you know, you kind of just become hyper-focused on 
at least from my ex from what I see for myself, I became hyper focused on you know just getting as clean as possible, and then I was realizing I'm not feeling the music anymore. That's right, and it, that's the most important part. And you know, I love your playing, and there's other GFA winners I absolutely love their playing. And then there's some, you know, you, you can definitely tell it was a very technically proficient performance, mm -hmm. but it maybe it just didn't really, didn't really speak to the heart as much. And in my opinion, that's what music is all about. And a lot of my friends ask, oh, why aren't you doing competitions and stuff? And, you know, at some point, I think I might return back right. to doing some for a bit, but partly I want to do new repertoire. And also it's like, I want to love what I do. Absolutely. I want to always play with passion. And, you know, that's the, because it is a great opportunity, especially for young people, you know, as, yeah. as you were in your situation or as I was in mine. And because, like I told you, as a student, I didn't get opportunities to play concert. It doesn't exist for me. So doing yeah. a competition is about all you get. And then, you know, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to... And it can be to, very rewarding. And it yes. can be very exciting. You yeah. know, there, there's great aspects to them. But it's a uh, But there's that there's inherent price. flaw. Yeah, there's, yeah. This, there's this... It's for those that, who are really strong in their heads. You know, those young people who sincerely believe that no matter what sort of... Uh, I don't want to say abuse, but, but no matter what sort of kind of uh, mental trials they go through, that they're still going to love their instrument, they're going to love their music, and they're going to continue with it. Yeah. And those are kind of what those advanced competitions, they're, they're for those kinds of people. Yeah. Because mentally, it's 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 sometimes very frustrating. It's kind of like it's a game very draining. with your stuff. Yeah. You know, it's it's very, yeah, it's very draining. It's true. Um, I think there was like a certain point, sort of, again, doing these, these concerts to the GFA tour that... And trying to make it so that I had enough um, energy during them and had enough passion playing these concerts, um, it was kind of my realization that there was there was literally no point in being nervous for concerts. And this, um, for me, is very unique because I actually feel like I got over my nerves on stage, which have always been a problem in my life. And um, and I and I kind of realized that it had to do with the fact that I wasn't thinking of it properly, and I didn't have the right image of what music was and what I was doing there performing on stage. And I think this was a little bit augmented um, because of sort of the competition life I had before. Um, I, I kind of realized that that you know me as as myself, my role is, is more of that of a worker of some sort. And that we have this long tradition of classical music, which is very, which is a beautiful thing, and that essentially there's no sort of original creation actually in this classical music. That it all comes from a, from an evolutionary sort. In other words, um, you know, Bach could not be Bach without Buxtitude and uh, maybe even Telemann and and uh, or Vivaldi, and Stravinsky could not be Stravinsky if it weren't for Bach and and even jazz and later Schoenberg. Um, and so all these things, these, these sort of, it's almost like mimetics that, that, that music, it just sort of advances through times and changes over and over again. And the tradition of interpreting music through a, through a concert setting, um, is very much like that of a worker that you're just, you have a set job, which might be hard, that is, but still your job is to go there and perform the music as, as, uh, as best you can and as, as thoughtfully and honestly you can. Um, and that's very simple. Actually, it's not complicated because you're not putting so much so much um, thought onto yourself that so much importance onto yourself that you would actually need to be nervous for a concert, which I think is a fault in and of itself. This is a really interesting way to look at it, and it's so true. And myself included, a lot of musicians get so caught up, maybe partly because of competitions. You know, we've got to play as cleanly as possible, and I, I just love. What Yo Yo Ma says about it, that it's about the notes you, you play right, not the ones you play wrong. <laughs> and I, I would much rather be at a concert where someone is just playing with passion, loves the music, even if it's messy, as opposed to someone who's a great technician, but just doesn't have the soul behind the piece. And, um, you know, nerves are definitely very natural and it happens to almost everybody. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, this is going to start to get philosophical. I guess we're in San Francisco. <laughs> but uh, no. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just a concert. If you take a look at this world, at this universe, microscopic. Does it matter if we make some exactly. mistakes? No. Does it matter we made someone's day better? 
Does it matter we affected somebody? Does it matter um, that we brought emotion into a performance? Absolutely. Absolutely. And those are things that are much more important than whether you made you know mistakes or not. And then it's like, how do you get that kind of soulful, soulful, for, for, sorry, soulful performance? Um, and for me, it has a lot to do with this like idea of, of personal style, because I think if you're searching too much for your own personal style as if you have to say something special, then you're probably going to end up lying than being honest yeah. about it. You need and, to be yourself. Yeah, exactly. And, and like so, we're talking earlier, you know, with these different ways of teaching, if you're kind of taught to do absolutely everything in a very measured way, it's just not going to come through correctly. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, I think it's tough because a lot of other things, you know, sports, mathematics and stuff, there's very kind of set definitions and um, equations and way to go about things. But I think music, it's really a, a discovery for everybody, you know, regardless of what you're playing, even if you're learning a little simple piece, it's discovering what works and what you like yeah even in that one little simple piece you know there can be so much kind of different emotions that you could bring out in one yeah. little phrase it's um i think that's what's so amazing about music even even a something like lagrima you know S tiny little piece you know and everyone's probably doing a face palm right now but you but know it's different every time you hear you you hear can it, you, know? you can shape it in so many different ways i mean you, you can hear the ones that are just like you know, Williamsing or playing, copying like Bream or yeah. Williams, but and don't get it wrong. There's yeah. ways to f it up, but yeah. um, there's so many different ways yeah, to absolutely. go about it in, be yeah. in a beautiful style. And you know, the, the thing with with concerts too is just like there's the, there's a the huge difference of playing a concert versus a competition. That the people who show up to your concerts took the day, took the time out of their day to come see you. And they want, they're with you 100%. They want you to do well. They want to hear something that they, they can take enjoy away. They want to enjoy it. Absolutely. But whereas, whereas if, I mean, it's a weird feeling when you're playing in the final of a big competition. You're you playing feel in like front people of have people. a little uh, tally chart. How many oh, mistakes every, does everybody this guy does. Make? It's yeah. not just the jury. And oh, everybody is like, then there's the, you know, the, maybe the friends of your competitors <laughs> who you feel, the posit you feel the positivity in the room when you screw up. Yeah, and this is kind of <laughs> this is this is like you hear you feel somebody just yes yeah he's screwing up and then there you are on stage like oh no I feel the money slipping through my fingers it's all on the there it goes five thousand no um, well you know what Pepe says about performing and nerves and stuff he says that he goes on stage and he makes a mistake so the guitarists are happy. <laughs> Thank you, Javier, for being on the show. Please join me in two weeks for a conversation with Bill Kattegeiser of the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. We'll wrap things up today with the last movement from Dushan Bogdanovich's Guitar Sonata No. 3, the piece that Javier spoke of earlier. I highly recommend checking out his album. It had such a great arc to it uh, with his repertoire choices. Uh, it just felt really unique, and it was... Very excited to listen to as a whole. I'm David Steinhardt. We'll see you next time for the Tone Based Classical Guitar Podcast. Thank you.